So today, I have a great lesson for you. And on the other hand, if it's not, if you've already gotten a donut, you cannot leave. <laughs> you have to stay for the hour. But uh, today, we're continuing Mark's series about God CV. This is kind of a, a sub lesson within it, so it won't be in his book unless I can, you know, twist his arm to get it in. But this is uh, something that I've been thinking about, and it deals with God and who he is and how he deals with us. So I said it would be perfect to have in the lesson. So when we have the God CV, you see that there includes someone's qualifications, their resume, their education, their experience. What if we also had their struggles? What if when you got someone's resume, you were considering to hire them for a position that they also listed several of their struggles? Would that be helpful? Well, it depends on who you are. <laughs> helpful maybe for the company, maybe not for you, or in some cases, showing your struggles would uh, kind of indicate the person that you are and how you've overcome them. So there could be a benefit as well. But um, this is not a normal part of a CV to have someone's struggles. <clears throat> so the, the name of the lesson today is The Struggle is Real. And uh, I was just recently in Israel, y'all may remember, uh, here is a shot of the Areopolis, if I'm saying that correctly, where they would have chariot races. There, this is in Caesarea Maritime, the one by the sea, not Philippi, Caesarea. Uh, that's our group over to the right, not in the middle. Uh, so this would be a great place to have your chariot races, maybe a, a battle with a, a lion or a tiger. You know, back then they did not have TV. So in order to entertain, they would, you know, gather up and they would see some exciting, exhilarating things that would happen. I drove by the tomb and confirming that it's still empty. This is actually uh, probably not Jesus' tomb, but one that was on the side of the road. It had a round uh, vault or door, and so I took a quick picture. I'll just show them. This is a bus that we were on that while we traveled through Israel. Some friends of ours. This was my favorite part, the sea, I mean, the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, it's not a very large garden at all. And so if you believe the Bible that Jesus was there and prayed there, then you are walking all over his footsteps while you're in this very small garden. And so I had the opportunity to pray there and to uh, walk around. And it was, again, one of my favorite spots. This is a picture of the uh, dungeon underneath where Pilate had Jesus on trial. This is where they would tie the prisoner up before he was scourged. And so probably somewhere down here, Jesus walked and was and was scourged. There I am at the Wailing Wall. I'm wearing a white yarmulke because when you go here, you have to, if you're a guy, you have to wear a yarmulke. And I had left my yarmulke on the bus. So I wasn't able to wear mine, but I am now. That um, when you're at the Wailing Wall, you have to pray with Yamaka, and I think they call it something else too, so I'm not an expert in the nomenclature. Do you know why the Wailing Wall is where the favorite and most possess, prized possession place to pray for a Jew? Do you know why that wall is it? Anyone? Okay, this is right at the temple. And why this wall of the temple It's because it's closest to where the Holy of Holies would have been inside the temple. That is where God was in the Old Testament. And so this is the closest that anyone could get to God without getting in the temple. And of course, they couldn't be in the Holy of Holies. This was the closest. And so this is why this is where the Wailing Wall is. And so here, there's a lot of people that are standing out there praying, wailing, begging God for his mercy and for his grace in their life because of the struggles in their life. And that's what I want to bring us to today as we start our lesson. The struggle is real. And if you say that five times fast, it sounds like the struggle is real. You like that? Okay, that's not just a little Brent pun. That is, uh, I should say, the correlation between Israel and struggle is very close and very tight. Can anyone tell me, and uh, I, I want to let you be a part of this lesson today, but can you tell me, anyone, how struggle relates to the term Israel? What is it? So she's right. 
Israel, to translate it from Hebrew to English, El is the Hebrew word for what? God. So yes, this is the class that would know that. Isra would be what? Contends or struggles. So Israel means to struggle with God. Now there's some other definitions that they've worked in as well, but I think this is the first because we'll understand why as we look at Jacob in Genesis chapter 32. Israel means struggle with God. And today we're going to look very closely at how struggle works in our lives. So start off begs the question, who of you struggle? Now some of you or at the age where you've kind of worked through most of your struggles and you don't really have them anymore, right? Because it's true, the older you get, the less you struggle, the more you enjoy life. Why are you laughing? <laughs> it turns out that the older we get, it's ironic because we should be more prepared and, and set and yet our body begins to fall apart more and more among other things and we have the struggle. And also when you're older, your children and then your grandchildren, there's more in your family. And between all of them in your family, you have concern and you struggle for your family, depending on what's happening. So yeah, the older we get, the more we struggle. So those of you who are young and you think your life is just falling apart and you have all of these struggles, just be warned, <laughs> it gets worse. It gets a lot worse. So struggle well now and you'll be prepared later. How many of you say that the struggles that you have are physical, mental, or social, or all of the above? Easy answer. Anytime there's D, all of the above, always pick D. Most of the time, that is the correct answer. Not always, but in this case, it is. Yeah, where our struggles not only are physical, which I just mentioned when that you get the diagnosis or um, you have a headache or all those physical things, but your relationships in your social areas, uh, your, your mental acuity uh, causes problems. That thing that I shouldn't have forgotten is causing me trouble now, and I'm struggling with the consequences of that forgetfulness and other mental things. And I would say that all of those things, physical, mental, and social, all relate to the spiritual. I believe that all of life is spiritual. So everything that goes on in those other realms, it deals with and, and affects, and our spiritual life also con conversely affects those areas. All of life is spiritual. Our struggle, though, is also spiritual in some cases. So I want to look at, as we look at this lesson today on struggling, where it all began in the life of Israel, the nation of Israel, would you say that they've had more or less struggle? How many of you say more? See, show of hands. How many of you say less? Those are the optimists in the room. Israel has had a lot of struggle in their lives. And uh, obviously the, the biggest one would be the Jewish Holocaust that went on during World War II. Um, horrible situation, but the, a crowning achievement of struggle. Since then, I know that being in Israel about three weeks ago, our guides were explaining to us that Israel, where it's located, and all of its neighbors, uh, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, um, Gaza, all that area, all of those neighbors hate the Israelites. And they're working hard to eradicate the Jews from that area so that they can own that land and no longer have Israel as a nation. Even to the point of wanting to rewrite history to eradicate the idea or the memories of Israel. They're hated that much. Now, what if you on your cul-de-sac had every neighbor around you that hated you and were trying to get you pushed off the island? <laughs> how would that make you feel? <laughs> you know how that is? <laughs> I don't want to live on your cul-de-sac. Yes. Yes. Okay, she's from this area. She's a Christian. Muslims. Okay. 
right? So what she's saying is that most of the Muslims and then those religions, as a result, it's built into their culture, into their religion, and that's their life. And so that has a good explanation of why it's happening. But it, it just goes to show the struggle is real. And if you put yourself in that situation, how you would feel that all of your neighbors hate you, I mean, you would eventually want to just leave. I mean, let's go somewhere else. But who gave them that land? God did. It was the promised land promised to them by their forefathers. They finally got it and they are holding on with your strength as, as they should and as they will. That, uh, that's the situation though. So we can name Israel's struggles today. We can also name them from the Old Testament. Does anyone off the top of their head think of any particular struggles that Israel had? What is it? In Egypt, they were in, in bondage in Egypt. They were slaves. They went to Egypt for a good reason. Turned out years later, it ended up being bad. So that was a struggle. And they called out to God. And when they called out to God, did God immediately fix the problem? No. He left them in the struggle until his timing. And we'll talk more about that. I want to jump all the way back to Abraham and Isaac. This is before the nation of Israel was a nation. It was an idea that God had already pulled Abraham aside, said, I want you to become a new nation. I'm going to make a nation out of you. And with this nation, he didn't even tell him the name yet. I'm going to teach the world about who I am. I'm going to give the world my CV or my resume through the nation of Israel. They were a chosen nation, a, chase, a people of God's own choosing. And how would you like to be that country that God chose to show everybody else who he is ended up being a rough description of life. So Abraham was pulled aside. The nation hadn't started yet, the idea of the nation. And he said, through you, I'm going to build this nation. Through you and your, your wife, Sarah, you will have uh, generations and generations, more than the stars in the heavens, more than the sands on the beach. The problem was what? Sarah and Abraham could not have children. So only God would choose someone who couldn't have children to give them children in order to do this great miraculous thing that he wanted to do, reveal his CV to the world. And so he did. He gave them the solution, a son, Isaac. Several years later, he told Abraham that I want you to do something with Isaac that blew Abraham's mind. What was that? You're a great class. Mark's going to be so proud of y'all. You're passing the test. Yeah, he said, I want you now to sacrifice your son. Well, it's interesting because having been in Israel three weeks ago, I did learn something. It was an educational experience, among other things, that I thoroughly enjoyed. In Canaan, which is where God said, I'm going to give you the Canaan land. I'm going to give you that. I'm going to drive out the Canaanites, and I'm going to put in Israelites, once he would name them. In Canaan, they worshiped the god Moloch. Have you heard of the god Moloch? I know Mark has talked about it before. The big thing with the fertility god Moloch was that he required child sacrifice. That was a very common thing for the Canaanite area. Child sacrifice was not prevalent, but it was a bit of the norm. It was not unusual. So when God asked Abraham, to sacrifice his son Isaac, Abraham was probably thinking, well, this sounds about right. I mean, this is normal for this area. I mean, this is what happens, and maybe this is what I have to do to get to the next level that God's promised me, and well, I'm going to do that. Well, hearing the news that I want you to sacrifice your son, could you imagine the struggle in Abraham's life? A lot of you are putting your, yourselves into his position. Those of you who have children can imagine it even more. The, and that is a serious struggle. Imagine having to explain to Sarah what, what had happened afterwards because he didn't talk about it beforehand. You know, Isaac himself carried the wood himself to be sacrificed, not knowing, realizing at the time that he was the intended sacrifice. And it got to the point where Abraham was about to sacrifice his son. And what happened? God said, stop, and provided a substitute, a ram caught in the thicket. Again, only God could do that, a type of Christ that God would one day be the sacrifice and send a substitutionary atonement for sin and for uh, the sacrifice that was needed. 
And Abraham was able to sacrifice the ram and save his son Isaac. Well, in an area where child sacrifice was prevalent and the god Moloch was depicted as a big brass person with his hands stretched out and they would heat him up fire hot and they would lay children in and, and they would be killed. And if, that, if not there, then in the fire down because as a fertility God, you would give him a sacrifice and it was a sacrifice intended to get better things as a result. Understand? Again, very normal. And for that culture to hear the story of Abraham and Isaac, that this God that's reve- beginning to reveal himself through this nation that he's building does not require child sacrifice. That was huge. And without being there and hearing that, I didn't understand the implications of what this story in the Bible means. But to that area, it was huge. And for them to understand that there's, there's another way, there's a better way, and it's coming, it's being revealed. Right here, you can see the Dome of the Rock. This is the Temple Mount. I show you this picture. I took it while I was in Israel. It is extremely interesting because this is the place where Mount Haram was, where Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac, where the substitution came and he sacrificed the ram. That's where that happened. Years later, it's where Solomon built the temple. And then that temple was destroyed. Later, the, uh, the temple that we're more aware of uh, was built. And then it was destroyed in 70 AD. Uh, A lot of wars and fighting going on since then. The Muslims uh, built that, I think, what they call that, the Dome of the Rock, that gold piece there that they have on the Temple Mount. The, The Israelites, the Jews also own a part of that. And I think another group does. There's a lot of tension that's there. People that don't like each other, but they consider this a holy and great place. But in the history of Israel, this is where all of those things took place right here in this spot. And now today we can go where um, uh, Jerusalem, we can go to Jerusalem and we can worship and we can pray for Jerusalem and for the day that God will, uh, his second coming and establish rulership there. So that's an interesting picture and all that it entails. So I'm going back to the struggle now, the nation of Israel. We have Isaac, uh, he marries Rebecca. Here's the family tree, he marries Rebecca. And then they have Jacob and Esau. Now, Jacob and Esau are twins. I have twins. Uh, we have some twins that are down here. So before you're born, you're basically woomates. Yeah, before your twins are born, they're, they're woomates. And I only say that not, not to try to be funny, but I only say that because these woomates, Jacob and Esau, were fighting even inside the womb where the Bible says that Rebecca said, why is this happening to me? Scripture says that God tells her, you have two nations inside of you warring against each other. That was a precursor of what was to come. So they have Jacob and Esau. Esau comes out. He's hairy. They call him Esau. It means hairy. It works out real good. It's easy to remember his name. Next, Jacob, is, as is said, he's holding on to Esau's heel, coming out as if to say, I need to trip him up so I could be first. Didn't make it, but spent the rest of his life trying to become first. So they called him Jacob, and that name means trickster or supplanter or stumbling block, where again, if you're going to make someone stumble, what do you grab? You grab the heel so that they fall. And uh, I see it in football all the time. You know, those guys aren't diving for heads. They're diving for feet. You trip up the feet, the person falls. That's Jacob, and that's his life. He lived his life tricking people. You would not want to have a business dealing with Jacob. He would come out on top, and you would not know what hit you. He was really good at what he did. He lived up to his name. Frankly, he was named because of, of his action, and he did live up to that. Now, here's the struggle that amazed me when I began studying this idea and God in my mind bringing this whole idea of struggle and the reasons for struggle, the cause and the purpose. Back in January of this year, um, I, I read through Genesis, I think this is around Genesis chapter 30, thinking before that as a seminarian and as a student of the Bible, that of course Isaac married Leah, I'm sorry, Rachel, his favorite wife, and they had 12 sons and those were the 12 tribes of Israel. That did not happen that way. That was much too clean and much too easy. In fact, here he, he married, um, when he went to Laban and found Rachel, he had to work seven years to get her. Turns out he only got Leah, the older daughter. And what did Laban say? 
It's our tradition that we get the older one married before the younger one. The older one's more important than the younger one. The older has a better blessing than the younger one. What does Jacob say? Oh, yeah, that's in my family too. I worked my whole life to try to get around that. And look what you just did. You're a bigger trickster than I am. Tricked me into doing the right thing, the older one first. He worked another seven years to get Rachel, and it went along after that that he um, hit the road. But we can see here the order of the sons that were born that make up the 12 tribes of Israel. The first four sons were born to Leah, the wife he was stuck with, not the one that he wanted. Not that he didn't love her. I'm not, I don't know how all that went down, but um, the first four came from... Then the next two, five and six, came from his favorite wife's servant. That's not right. That does not seem like, God, are you sure you knew what you were doing here when you did all this? The next two were born uh, to Leah again. And then the next, I'm sorry, no, the next two were Leah's servant, Zippor. Then the nine and 10 were born to Leah, the first wife. And finally, the last two for Jacob's favorite wife, the one that he really wanted in the first place, she only had the last two tribes of Israel, and that is Joseph and Benjamin. Can you imagine the family drama, the struggle, if you will, with all of this going on? I mean, it played out when we see what happened to Joseph, right? He got sold into slavery, tried to get killed, and then sold into slavery and put in jail. And uh, just the struggle continued on in his life. And the family uh, reaped the benefits or the anti-benefits of all of that struggle. For Israel, which they weren't named Israel yet, it's still just Jacob and and the guys, The struggle was real. God had already been using struggle in their life, and now he continues to. So the question is, why does Israel struggle? The same answer would be, why do we struggle? Because we all said a second ago that, yeah, struggle still happens in our lives. So I want to ask this question. Does God use purposefully struggle in our lives? Or does he allow struggle until we pray for it to be relieved and then he comes in and saves the day by relieving the struggle to make us more uh, happy and hopeful about the things of God? Does he allow struggle and then when, when it gets so bad he takes it away? Or does he purposefully use struggle to teach us and grow us? The answer is yes. Both of those things are absolutely true. The latter we would easily say yes to because that makes God a lot nicer and a little more understandable. But the former is also true, that God purposes struggle in our lives and he uses it. It's what we call the school of hard knocks. Turns out it is a really great university to attend. God is the superintendent, the principal, and the dean, and he uses it all the time. If you don't believe me, let's read the Bible. He says here uh, in Isaiah 55 about why we struggle. He says, incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live. Shema, hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. Here it is. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways. Let the unrighteous man his thoughts. It would be forsake his thoughts in that uh, poem. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. That's the answer of why God uses struggle, why God allows struggle. Because we are on a different course. And this is not new to you guys. We know this. God came, sent his son Jesus to redeem us to set us on a new course. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, those who are in Christ Jesus are a new creation. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Better stated, are becoming new because they don't just become new, do they, Gary? No, we're still struggling with those things that are in our lives that should be a thing of the past, but they keep creeping up. We keep dealing with them. And God says, I need to deal with you on that because I need you to be better than you are. In fact, I need you to be who I intended you to be. I have a will and I have a way for you to go and it's different for you than it is for you, than it is for you, than it is for you. And so y'all can't correlate and get together and say, what's the plan? What do I need to do? What's the next step? It's ought to be different. And it takes work to get it. Work is not just a byproduct. It is the actual product. 
So let me continue. What are the causes of struggle? Well, the top on the list, we would say what? Yes, you're right. Again, y'all are so smart. <laughs> That's what I would have said. The devil. What did Flip Wilson say? The devil made me do it. I'm not going to take responsibility. It's his fault. He does take a lot of fault because that is his job. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, he works at causing you to stumble, to fall, to get off track, to do the wrong thing, to make the wrong decision, to take those consequences that are just terrible, and they cause a struggle in your life. Where does struggle come from? First and foremost, I'll agree with you that the devil, Satan, Beelzebub, Hasatan, the accuser, the stumbling block, he is the one that causes so much pain and struggle in our life. We all agree. Number two, who else is the cause of struggle? Who? Yes. Even if the devil gave us a break and said, I am going to leave this person alone for a while, we would still make bad decisions. We would still do wrong things because our ways are not God's ways. Now, hopefully you're conforming to his image, right? And you're getting closer that your ways are his ways. That's what he wants. Do you get that? God wants your ways to be his ways. So when you pray, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, modeled by Jesus, then that's a person that understands Oh, you're getting this. It's God's will. It's not my will. I need to know what he wants, not what I want. I need to stop pushing my agenda and allow him to do his agenda. But when that happens, these agendas that we still haven't relinquished clash, and that causes the struggle. Am I making a good point? The last thing, the last person, the last entity that causes struggle, the, the cause of struggle, I propose, is God himself. Now, I'm saying more than that God just allows the struggle and teaches us lessons, that God sometimes, not all the time, because sometimes it is the devil. Sometimes it's just me. Sometimes it's God who initiates the struggle to bring about a change in my life in order to conform me to his will. We saw it in Abraham and Isaac. Did Abraham have to... Have to uh, sacrifice Isaac because of a bad decision that he made? Did he have to because he lost a bet? He said, you know, if, if you do this, I'll do this. And it worked out wrong and he messed up. And now he's got to, no. Had nothing to do with Abraham at all, except that God wanted to use Abraham to teach Abraham and the rest of the world a lesson in this case about child sacrifice and really more than that about who God is a loving, caring God. And so here's a point that God initiated, God sustained the struggle until he was ready to bring it to a close, and he did. We can see that same struggle in different situations in our own lives because now what you're having to do is decide when a, when a struggle comes, is this my fault? Is this something that Satan did? Or is this something that, that God is doing in me? I think another great example would be Job. Remember Job, he was a righteous man. Righteous means right, so he was correct. Now, I don't know how right he was. The Bible just says he was righteous. I always say, I, I don't know. I didn't know Job. I didn't visit with him. I don't know his frame of reference. So I don't know exactly what righteous means. But he was righteous, according to the Bible. And Satan comes and says, hey, I'm bored. I need something to do. And God says, hey, have you considered my servant Job? You can do whatever you want to with him except kill him because I need him alive to show you, Satan, that no matter what you do, what is Job going to continue doing? The right thing and worshiping me in spirit and truth. And I want you to understand who I am, Satan. So, so God uses struggle in Job's life to teach Satan a lesson. How would you like to be the person that God wants to use to teach Satan a lesson? Any volunteers? <laughs> hey, that is not what anyone would want to volunteer for. What if though God chose you and said, I'm ready to use you, would you be ready? That's a whole nother question. Maybe you are, or maybe you're still working to get to that place. What we need to be is getting to that place. What did Job do once he kept complaining to God, trying to understand God, trying to put God in his realm? 
In his perspective, he was visiting with his wife, with his three friends. They went on and on and on trying to figure out and make sense as he sat in ashes and scraped the boils off of his uh, arm with broken pot glass, broken pottery. Have any of you had boils? I've had a boil before, very small by comparison and very painful. I can't imagine his frame of reference, his state of mind, his situation, except at some point when God finally spoke, do you know that God didn't speak to him about that situation for a long time? Do you remember? In other words, God doesn't just give us a struggle so that he could come in and save us. He let Job struggled through it because it was for Satan that he was proving a point. Not only Satan, but I would also say to you and to me today, because what are we doing? We're looking back, studying Job and learning how to live life today. So Job suffered to teach you. How would you like to be that person? I would not, but I would hope that if it came to that, that I would be willing to to be used by God. Nevertheless, finally, God speaks and he asks Job. He says, where were you when I created the world? He says, Where were you, what were you doing whenever I put things in order and organize things and have a plan and a, and a, and a history that I'm going to put into motion? Where were you and what were you doing? And what did Job do? Job put his hand over his mouth. He had absolutely nothing to say. He, yeah, he did repent in sackcloth and ashes. There was nothing more to say, no more to understand. God is God. He is sovereign. He is in control. And I don't manage God's agenda. I conform to his will. In this earth, and I've told, I taught this class, uh, two other classes earlier today. I've had, this is my third time, so I'm on a roll. That as we uh, learn from the things of God, as, as, as God, well, I just lost that train. That train just went. So that's okay. It'll come back if it's, if it's important. The other class has got it. God's will is that you didn't need to hear it. <laughs> All right, so there's plenty to say, so let me just move on. Um, now, I want to hit Genesis 25 through 31, do a quick review, because this is where the struggle is in Scripture. We have the birth of two nations, remember Jacob and Esau, womates wo- uh, warring in the womb. Uh, once they were born, uh, Jacob had the opportunity to buy the birthright out of Esau. In other words, Esau considered it's not something to be grasped, held onto in the moment of weakness. He sold it for a bowl of porridge. There's more to the story. We don't have time to get into it. And then the blessing was stolen. As they got older, Isaac, the dad says, I'm old. I need to give you my blessing, Esau. Go and get some food, fix it up for me. We'll have a meal and I will bless you as I plan to. Well, Rebecca, Esau's mom heard that. She favored Jacob And in a tent, there's not a lot of secrets. You can hear everything that's going on. So she's aware of the plan, and she's like, while he's gone, Jacob, you and I are going to do the pull off the biggest swindle in the world. I'm going to make you the birthright. You already have the, I mean, the the, the birthright. You already have the birthright. I'm going to give you the blessing. The blessing is big because you're going to be the father of a nation. It's going to be great. So he puts on the animal skins, and she fixes up the stew. He goes in and uh, gets the, the, the blessing. So Esau's mad. Jacob fled. Where does he go? Uncle Laban's house. His mom's brother, Laban, lives further out, away from the promised land. So here we have the father of the country, Jacob in this case, leaving the hometown, the promised land, in fear to get away because of the dumb things that he's done. And he goes and he hangs out with Laban. And we already talked about how Laban tricked him. And then the biggest swindle that uh, Jacob then turned back on Laban. You know, Laban had already tricked him with the two daughters. And then uh, Jacob says, it's time for me to leave. And Laban says, or Jacob says, well, hey, I need to take some uh, animals and some livestock with me. Uh, Why don't I take the ones that are uh, blemished and you can keep the good ones? And then Jacob went around and and blemished all the good ones so that he could take them later. Yeah, so the, the trickster still living up to his name. That's my only point there. So Jacob fears. He is now, God comes back to Jacob and he says, now, I'm going to send you back to the promised land where you belong. That's where you're going to go. I'm with you. Everything's taken care of. So what does Jacob do? What does he do? He is in fear. God says, I'm going to take care of you. If you're trying to read the scripture, it will not help you. It's coming up next. So um, even though God says, I'm I'm with you, I'm going to take you back and, and fulfill my dream, my idea, my nation that I've got going, he sends him back and and. Uh, Jacob says, okay, God's good, but if he doesn't 
take care of business, I've got a few things that I can do because I know how to take care of business as well. I've been doing it all my life. So he got his two wives, Jake, uh, Leah and Rachel, and he divided up all of his livestock and all of his possessions into two groups, thinking, he says, if Esau attacks and kills one set, maybe the other set will, will survive and I'll at least have one wife and half of my possessions. And then he stayed in the back and watched all this happen. You know, God says, I'm going to take you. So wives, go, make way, make peace. And we'll see what happens. What a great guy. What a great father of a nation. You know, someone that, that frankly needs to be built up to where he needs to be because he's not there yet. So he, he sends them out. And now he is alone because he sent everyone away to go ahead of him in Genesis 32. And Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. So, and Jacob again, uh, mentally, socially, spiritually, a lot of struggling. Here, a physical struggle was on. So who was the man? The Bible does not clearly state about who the man, but uh, we can look, he was either in some places defined as an angel. You can look at Hosea 12 and it talks back about this and about being an angel. But who is an angel? Angelos, the Greek for angel, means messenger. So either it was God or it was God's messenger. Either way, it was God. Uh, it could have been a theophany, as some scholars uh, suggest. A theophany is an, uh, a showing of God himself, theo being God, so a theophany. Um, otherwise, the pre-incarnate Christ, it could have been a Christophany, uh, a, a manifestation of Christ before he was born through Mary, there were several instances of a Christophany in the Old Testament. Mark has talked about several of these where Christ appeared. And it, it is the, the, the revelation of God on earth. Because remember, in John 4, 24, it says that God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Quick hint, we cannot see spirits. Now, some of you who are into like all the apparitions and all those things, and they've seen different spirits or things or whatever, those, if, even if they are, they're manifestations of those spirits because we can't see spirits. So we can't see God. And the Bible says, in fact, no one has seen God. But what did Jesus say? In John 14, 9, he says, when they, the disciples said to Jesus, again, the manifestation of God on earth, the disciples said, well, Jesus has said, you've seen the Father, you've seen God. And they said, we, we've not seen God. Who is, please show us God. He says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. I am God on earth. I'm God and I'm his manifestation on earth so that you can relate to God through a human form. Uh, so in this case, I believe that it is a, a Christophany that Jesus walked up and appeared to Jacob while he was alone. Now imagine, and I was there in the, those caves in Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, uh, this area at night, it's all those weird sounds, the, the darkness and the shadows, you know, you see things and your mind plays tricks on you. He was already struggling. He was already in a bad place. Imagine what he was going through mentally. And then he sees this image and what is he saying? There's no one there. That's not anything. That's my mind. That's tricking me. I'm not going to fall for that. I know better. Then the image comes closer and they begin wrestling. He's like, oh my goodness, this is something. So he begins wrestling and the wrestling happened until the breaking of the day. So the imagery here is fantastic where they wrestled, the Bible says, all night. How many hours is night? Four, five, depends on how many hours you sleep, right? Six, 10, my daughter's 12. Night is a long time for some people, shorter for others. We don't know exactly the hours, but there was many hours of physical wrestling. And yet the man, the mystery man, Christ, did not prevail against Jacob and Jacob was tired. It happened till the breaking of the day. So they fought in the darkness and as the daylight began to break the dawn and to illuminate and reveal truth, the same thing was happening in Jacob's life. He had been walking in darkness and deceit his entire life, knowing about God. And when he prayed to God, he did not pray, oh God, he prayed, God of my father and my grandfather. Those, the God of them, if you're available, I need help in these areas. That's how Jacob prayed. Not 
as he is my God. He's their God. I've seen him do some stuff. I'm willing to throw that out, but I've also got some backup plans just in case. Do you see the lack of faith in his life? I want you to know his frame of reference. In this situation, he's at that point until the breaking of the day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. So if there are any wrestlers in the room, you know that if your hip is out of socket, you're no longer a contender. You can no longer struggle because you can't get the leverage that you need to wrestle. So here people say, well, how could a man prevail against God or or Christ in this situation? That's not what the scripture is saying that even though the man didn't prevail against Jacob, Jacob didn't prevail against him either. Later it says that Jacob prevailed, but did he prevail physically or spiritually? Have to be spiritually because physically we know that just with the touch of the hip that Jacob's hip was uh, displaced. And so the man, the Christ man, had the upper hand the entire time. The struggle is on. They transition from dark until light. And then it says in verse 26 of Genesis 32, then he said, let me go, the man, uh, having Jacob's hip displaced. He was hanging on to now the God that he understood better, that the struggle revealed to him, to Jacob, who God is, not only his grace, but his power. And he's hanging on to the man and as the day broken. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asks a simple question. What is your name? Now think with me back to the last time that Jacob was asked, what is his name? Who asked Jacob his name? Isaac, his father before the blessing, when Jacob snuck in, when Esau was gone and he went in and and said, dad, I'm ready to get my blessing. And he said, who are you? What is your name? And what did Jacob say? Esau. He said, I'm hairy man, feel, smell. I'm not who you think I am. Although Isaac was a little suspect. Jacob was the liar and the deceiver. And in doing so, he called himself Jacob. Now the irony in this case, in order to be blessed, the question is asked again, what is your name? What does he say this time? He says, my name is Jacob. That's how I know that the transition, the fight, the wrestle is over for Jacob and that he had come full circle into where he needed to be. Maybe he didn't come full circle. Maybe he went 180 degrees, the opposite direction, to where he needed to be, that he owned up to his name. What did he say? More than just that, I am Jacob. He said, I am the deceiver. I am the trickster. I'm the one that's got four or five plans to make sure I get my way. God, that's who I am. And what did God say to him? He says, you're no longer going to be named Jacob. That's not going to be who you are anymore. It's more than just a name. It was who he was. Now, of all the stories that we could have heard about the Israelites all through the Old Testament, we only hear certain stories. We're only able to know of certain stories that God picked out for us to know and to grow. This is a quintessential story that is so important in the life of Jacob, the nation of Israel, and the life of you and me. He says, God says to Jacob, I'm now not going to know you as the trickster anymore. You are now the person who struggles with God. You are Israel. You are the, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not the victor. You can translate this as, as the, the victor, the one who contends and wins. But based on the story, I see that Israel is, I struggle with God. And the struggle of the Israelite nation continues until today where they are quite simply the most hated nation in the world by a vote of the nations on this planet of earth. You see that? They are the ones that struggle with God and God reveals himself in the struggle. I propose to you today that the struggle is not just what God allows and then can save us from when he's ready to. Instead, that in some cases and not all, But God begins, God initiates, God is the genesis of the struggle. He causes the struggle and it's for his good will and conforming us 
to turn us into, in this case, Jacob, turning him into the leader of a nation that he needed to be. God needed to be his God. And after all the things that he worked through, it finally came to this ultimate where he literally wrestled with God. I don't see how you could explain it any other way. God initiated this struggle. God was the one that came in and said, I'm going to fight you and I'm going to show you that no matter what you do, you cannot prevail. And in the end, I'll prevail, but you will prevail spiritually. And that's where it says that he struggles with God and man and prevailed. So it gives us hope. So our application as we close out, uh, that God uses the struggles and he molds to, to mold and to prune us. He uses those struggles. We would all agree quickly that struggling prunes us and makes us better. You know, we try to give advice to our kids and we say, hey, don't be like me. I did this and I made a mistake. Do it like this. And they say what? Thanks. Thanks, mom. Thanks, dad. I think I got this. Maybe they don't say it out loud, but their actions are saying, thanks, mom. Thanks, dad. I think I got this. And then you see your kids and your grandkids go through the struggle and you're praying and begging God, give them a break. Don't put them through what I went through. What should your prayer be? What should your prayer be? As opposed to give them a break, why don't you pray what? Let them struggle. God, give it to them. And then when you're through, wrench it just a little bit more because this kid needs to learn a lot. And I have tried. You know I have tried. I need you to teach him a lesson. And God says, hey, this is already my plan. I did it with you, and I'm going to do it with them. Our struggles are different. And again, every struggle is not caused by God. Sometimes it's just my dumb decisions. And God says, there are consequences, but I love you, and by grace, I'm going to lift you up. Sometimes Satan comes in, and he causes a distraction, and we get off course for a while. It has nothing to do with God causing it, but has everything with God, to, with God using it to conform us back to his plan. And you say, well, what about my kid that just doesn't get it. He won't come back and he hates God. And he's like, I met him at the, uh, grocery, I'm at the uh, gas station yesterday. Remember a few, last time I taught, I met two ladies at the gas station, I invited them to church and they came. Well, I thought I'd keep going. Saw a guy at the gas station. I was filling up yesterday and uh, I said, hey, how's it going? Oh, good. I said, um, uh, asked him if he was going to church anywhere. Uh, it was kind of a way to get into a spiritual conversation. And he said, no, I don't really believe in God. I don't really get into all that. And I said, oh, so you're an atheist. And I said, you know, my teacher, Mark Lanier, he tells an atheist, the one who is not believing in God, there is no God, atheo. And he goes, well, I really don't like to have terms, but that's interesting the way that you describe that. So I said, well, but you, got, you do believe there's like a higher power. And he said, well, yeah. And I said, okay, so now you're an agnostic, a no, gnosis, you don't know if there's a God. He's like, oh, this is getting too complicated, so... <laughs> I said, well, uh, he, he said tomorrow's his birthday. And what he, he's going to be grilling. He's got some friends coming over. He's having his birthday. It's happy birthday. Way to go. The best present that you could give is be, uh, to have is to be present at church. See that? He didn't like it. He said, uh, no, no, thank you. He was very kind and uh, very nice. And uh, so we parted ways and he's not here today. Is he? Okay. No. But uh, so... Well, the, the point is that, that we have those struggles and there's some people that they just don't get it. They just don't get it. And we pray and we hope and we want. Sometimes it's, it's the struggle that is needed in their life that we're praying, God, please give them a break when we should be praying, God, do your will in their life. Isn't that what Jesus said? Let your will be done. And when Jesus, when Jesus asked for the cup to be passed, the second thing, the big thing I learned in Israel is that in the Passover, after the original Passover and the New Testament Passover, when Jesus was doing the Passover, they had these four cups and they, they re resembled redemption and the plagues and the sacrifice and the praise, the Hallel. Uh, Jesus went through that third cup with his disciples and he said, this cup, I'm changing it and it is a, a new covenant. This is the cup of the new cup. He was changing the whole Passover thing with the third cup. And then you hear him just after that in the garden of Gethsemane. And what does he ask? He prays for what? This cup 
to pass. And we all in our American culture are thinking, okay, well, this is getting on the cross and dying. I mean, that's a painful experience. I would want, if you're going to call it a cup or whatever, to pass. He was referring back to this cup of this, this new covenant, this, this, this sacrifice. That was the cup that he was asking to pass. You see the relation? I wouldn't have known if I hadn't gone. All of you, let's go to Israel next year, okay? So he, he asked for that cup to pass. It wasn't about the physical. He was talking about the spiritual. But even though that was the ask, the final was, God, your will be done, not mine. I need everyone to hear me pray this. I don't want to do this. I don't like this spiritual thing going on in my life. But God, you are in charge. You have a plan. And I want your will to be done in my life. So let the struggle continue. God bless you when you ask for and continue the struggle because God is teaching you. And it's not that you want the struggle to be in your life all the time, that God knows when it's going to be over. So in my challenge, the last story that I have is I uh, pump myself up just a little bit. I had this issue last year. I went to a Lanier Theological Library lecture at Mark's house. And afterwards, I run the sound, so during. So afterwards, in order to get over to visit with some people, I had to jump over his train track and run around the back way to get over to the people and the food. <laughs> so when I jumped over the train track that Mark has in his backyard, I aggravated my, I don't know if it's called the plantar or the fasciitis. What is it? Whatever. It was painful. So I, I eventually had plantar fasciitis, which any plantar fasciitis friends among you? Yes, I see you, you, you kind of go, yeah, because no one wants this. It is painful. So every time I walked with my left foot, I felt the pain to the point that I would just walk on the ball of my foot. So I would walk like this and I'd be thinking, do people know I'm walking on the ball of my foot? Do I look like an idiot? Because I feel the pain. I'm feeling the pain. At the same time, this was in November. So all through November and December, Every day, all the time. January. January is when I began understanding this uh, idea about struggle and how God causes it and uses it amongst others. And so with that in mind, I said to myself, you know what? I'm not going to pray that God would help my plantar fasciitis. You never saw that prayer request from me anywhere just as a little test. Like, I'm going to see how this thing goes. Instead of praying that the struggle would be relieved, God, how are you going to use the struggle in my life? So January, February, I continue having to walk weird uh, at night. I mean, even laying down, it would, it would hurt in the bed, like the sheet laying on it. I was never able to get comfortable. Driving in the car, my left foot just sits there, painful every time, no matter where I put it. It was constantly, and I said, I'm just going to be reminded of God every time I feel the pain. With every step, I feel the pain. I'm reminded of God. And what God is doing, I don't know, but I'll be happy that he hurries and gets to where he needs to get to so I can stop the pain. I remember walking from Methodist Hospital to St. Luke's because I do hospital visits along with the rest of the staff. There's a tunnel that goes underneath and it's really cool to walk. It's a long, 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 long tunnel to go from there to the other hospital. And as I'm walking along, you know, waiting for someone to come with a wheelchair and like, hey, can I borrow that? There were none. And so I just had to walk along in pain with every step. It wasn't until March that my pain relieved. And I, I was taking some medicine, some other things to help with... Uh, uh, whatever it is with your muscles and stuff. Um, finally in March, the, the pain stopped. I got up one day and there was no more pain. And I said to myself, praise the Lord. I, I don't have pain anymore. But as I walked, I remembered after what, three or four months of walking with pain, what was I thinking? How great God is singing his praises, thanking God. Uh, and I don't know what exactly he was teaching me through all that, except that sometimes the struggle is for a reason. And it was after that that I went back to hospital visits. And once again, I found myself walking in that tunnel from Methodist Hospital to St. Luke's downtown. And as I walked, I said to myself, this feels great. I remember it was just a month ago that this was the most painful walk of my life. And it was so hurtful. There were probably a hundred doctors around that could probably have done something, I don't know, amputated my foot or something that would have caused it to feel better. But all, all of that to say is that I wanted to change my prayer life and I wanted it to be different than what I normally did. In this case, instead of praying that God would heal, which I wanted him to heal, he knew my heart. So that was not a secret. But God, what do you want to teach me through this struggle? Whether it's you, me, or Satan that's causing it, I know you're trying to conform me to your will. I think it will change our prayer life and the way that we live our lives as a result if we see struggle in a new way. Will you struggle with me as I close us in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the way that you live to show us who we are in you. We are thankful that you 
know exactly what you're doing, that nothing gets beside you or behind you, nothing gets past you. You are on everything, and your will, I pray, be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as your people, called according to your name, as most of us are, that we ask that you continue to conform us and teach us through that school of hard knocks. If it's your will, teach us in other ways so it's not so painful. But I pray that you would help us not to miss you in every situation in our life so that we relate everything back to the spiritual. We are thankful, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.